Welcome, everybody. We'll be starting our webinar in another minute or so, just to give folks a chance to log on. Welcome everybody to the Smart Grid Center webinar series. We'll get started in one more minute and let a few folks get, get logged on. All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. Welcome to the New Mexico Smart Grid Center webinar on optimizing mentorship for your church teams. I'm Selena Keneally, the Education and Outreach Manager for New Mexico EPSCoR. Together with Brittany Vanderwerf, our Public Information Officer, I'll be hosting the webinar today. I've got a few housekeeping items before I introduce our speaker. First, this webinar will be recorded and archived on our web website, nmepscore.org. So you have an opportunity to share it with your colleagues who are unable to attend today. We'll also have time for questions at the conclusion of the presentation. So we ask that you please type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker for today's webinar. Christine Fund is a senior scientist at the Wisconsin Center for Education Research and the Department of Medicine at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Fund earned her PhD in cellular and molecular biology, followed by postdoctoral research in plant pathology, both at UW-Madison. Dr. Fund's work focuses on developing, implementing, documenting, and studying interventions to optimize research mentoring relationships across science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. Dr. Fund co-authored the original Entering Mentoring curriculum and has co-authored many papers documenting the effectiveness of this approach. Dr. Fun is the principal investigator of the National Research Mentoring Network Coordination Center. She's also the director of the Center for the Improvement of Mentored Experiences in Research at UW-Madison. And she's a member of the National Academies Committee that recently published the Consensus Report and Online Guide, The Science of Effective Mentorship in STEM-M. Welcome, Dr. Fun. Great. Thanks, Selena and uh, Brittany and Anne for the invitation and the help in bringing this to you. I am going to share my screen. There we go. All right. Wonderful. Well, hopefully uh, you can all see that. Um, so today um, I'm going um, to be sharing with you in our brief time together um, some of the work that we've been doing that hopefully will be of use to you as you think about ways to optimize your practice of mentorship uh, for your research teams. Just and, a moment, Dr. Yeah. Fund. We're, we're, yes. seeing your, um, we're seeing your screen with your notes attached to it. Well, how interesting. Let me reshare that. One moment, please. Same. How about that? Oh, there we go. Perfect. Yep. All right. Wonderful. Uh, great. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, so today, yeah, so I'll hopefully be sharing with you some things that help you optimize your practice. And um, I think it's important to say, absolutely want to honor the fact that hopefully many of you um, have been experienced mentors or may be newer to mentorship or definitely have the experience of being a mentee. 
um, across the board and honor that you, we have a range of experiences um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but we come from a platform in our work that all everyone's practice can be improved and optimized. And that's really the nature of uh, our discussion today. So uh, first I'd just like to learn a little bit more about you. And so I thought we'd do that using a poll. So let me go ahead and launch this poll. And so what I'd love to see uh, here is what career stage folks are at who are attending today. And so you can just click on your response and then I'll be able to share with you. And I have created another category. Uh, I apologize in advance if you are not listed and I've missed your category. You only have 10 responses, so I was limited. So we'll give folks another minute to respond or maybe 30 seconds. All right. Great, so let me uh, share those results with you. So uh, we have a, a range of folks today uh, ranging across different uh, stages of being faculty members, four, uh, four program coordinators or managers, and one other. Um, so thanks, um, nice to know who's here today. So let me close that. All right, so another question is, I want to honor the fact we're all living uh, in all of these different online engagements. And so I just wanted to give folks a chance to take a moment to think about what they're coming into the webinar feeling this uh, afternoon um, or morning if uh, you are on the West Coast. Um, and so I think that it is uh, just this poll I'm going to put up now. And again, just be honest, it's just uh, helpful to know wh where you are in your thinking this morning. If you're distracted, if you're struggling, if you're looking forward to taking an hour on mentorship and thinking about nothing else, or you don't want to share. All right, I'll give another couple seconds. All right. And of course, Selena, if there's anything I'm seeing that you're not seeing, let me know. So I'll share those results. And so it kind of have a spread is, you know, honoring the fact some of us uh, are distracted about what's happening around you and you're doing your best just to be here and we honor that. Others are looking forward to just taking their mind off everything and then in diving into mentoring as a topic. Um, even taking time for your own professional development can be a struggle under the current circumstances. And some of us are not quite sure. Um, I like to say I'm hour to hour these days. Um, and uh, of course, uh, it was your option to share. So thanks for sharing that and just acknowledging where folks are at. All right. So I wanted to just start to say that there's a lot of research on mentoring and I won't go through all of these studies, but just to say that mentoring matters. We know that strong mentorships enhance to a lot of measurable outcomes, including enhanced science identity, sense of belonging, self-efficacy in many domains, including research, persistence in a given career uh, degree lens, uh, research productivity, career satisfaction, and enhanced recruitment and persistence of those from traditionally underrepresented groups. And we also know that despite how important mentoring is, we know there's a very uneven research mentoring landscape. So we know that folks from traditionally underrepresented groups and even white women's mentorship requests are often ignored more than those by white men. We know that in general, there's many studies that have shown that folks from traditionally underrepresented groups receive less mentoring than their non-minority peers. And we also know um, in one of the uh, very famous studies um, from Donna Ginther and her colleagues was that minority investigators indicate that inadequate mentoring posed obstacles to obtaining funding. And there was a study done that in fact, um, with all things held constant, 35 different variables, folks from underrepresented groups received um, R01 funding from the National Institute of Health at a lower rate. And mentorship and lack of mentorship was one of the reasons cited. So this has caused a huge national focus in the last decade on mentoring. Um, and so um, I won't go through all of these, but just to give you a sense from the, at the National Science Foundation, we have a lot of focus and programs on mentorship and raising its visibility. Uh, private foundations like the Sloan Foundation 
and Howard Hughes Medical Institute have invested a lot in exemplary mentoring programs and requirements for the training of men the mentors and mentees that they support. The National Academy of Sciences has had three um, reports that highlighted specifically mentoring, and I'll specifically talk about the one Selena mentioned that was on the science of mentorship. And then the National Institutes of Health have really focused on mentorship in their dealing of individual development plans. They have new requirements for their training grants that mentors have to have some type of mentor training and um, have put a lot of money into the National Research Mentoring Network of which I'm one of the PIs. So I thought that it might be useful to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the findings from this newly released report on the science of effective mentorship in STEM. Now the second M here stands for medicine, so that's science, technology, internet, and medicine. Um, and this report was released at the end of October uh, last year. So the first thing is, is there even a science of mentorship? And in the sense that science is an intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of structures and behaviors, it is, there is a science to mentorship. Um, and what the science of mentorship does is it brings together multidisciplinary perspectives all the way from organizational and social psychology to discipline-based education and brings all of those disciplinary perspectives to bear on understanding what are effective behaviors in mentorship, the theoretical frameworks around mentorship, measures and assessments around mentorship, tools for mentorship, structures of mentorship, and the role of the institution and programs like EBSCOR in promoting effective mentorship. So I won't go through the entire report, but I wanted to tell you that if you haven't um, seen this report, there um, are chapters on what mentorship is, how identity affects mentorship, disciplinary context of mentorship, the role of mentorship in medical education, which might not be as relevant to this group, but just it is part of it, the work of programmatic mentorship and the role of the institution in creating an effective culture of mentorship. Um, and there um, is a large literature review in each of these areas in the report. Um, this is the committee who conducted the study, and I had the honor and privilege of being one of those folks. It was chaired by my dear friend and colleague, Angela Byers Winston, and supported um, by many uh, agencies, including uh, the National Academies. So one of the things that the committee put forth is there are lots of definitions out there about mentoring and mentorship. And the first thing I wanna highlight is we spent a lot of time on the committee struggling with the definition. And what we came up with and wanna promote is a move from the word mentoring to mentorship to honor that it takes both mentor and mentee in the relationship to have it be effective. And when we only talk about mentoring, we don't honor the important role that mentees play in that relationship. So we have put forth that mentorship is a professional working alliance in which individuals work together over time to support the personal and professional growth, development, and success of the relational partners, so mentor and mentee, through the provision of career and psychosocial support. And I wanna highlight this is both career support, so the kind of career guidance, skill development, and sponsorship that many of us engage in in mentoring, but also the psychosocial support, which is just as important. It's that emotional support and role modeling that are aimed at helping mentees develop their talent. And mentorship complements lots of other developmental processes like coaching and teaching um, and helping mentees develop skills and knowledge that are essential to this holistic development of STEM professionals and STEM identity development. So what I thought is using that definition of mentorship and thinking about your own roles in mentoring is I'm curious, and I'll put the poll up, by that definition, how many folks would you say you are currently mentoring? And I've had broad categories from zero to more than 20 here. Just a couple more folks um, to vote. Great. All right. So what we can see is in this group, 
we have a huge range of folks who are not currently uh, mentoring by that definition, and that may be just the role that you're in and you have other uh, interactions with mentees and responsibilities to one individual who's mentoring more than 20 folks um, by this definition, which is um, a huge uh, honor and responsibility and everything in between. So thank you for sharing that. And I think, you know, when you think about collectively, just the folks on this webinar, and if we were to add up all these folks, you're collectively mentoring so many people. And the, uh, again, the privilege and responsibility that comes with that. And also your commitment even attending this webinar to help optimize that practice and that impact. So in the report, the other thing is we wanted to honor the fact that mentorship occurs in lots of structures. So we have the classic dyad. So you might imagine yourself as mentor working with one mentee. So let's say myself working with an undergrad or Selena working with a graduate student. That would be in a classic dyadic relationship. But there are all of these other structures. There are triads in which we might have a mentor working with a graduate student and that graduate student working with an undergraduate or high school student. Now you're in a very interesting triadic relationship. Or you might have collective or group mentoring at the programmatic level where mentees are getting mentorship from multiple mentors as well as peer mentoring or near peer mentoring. And then you can move into these huge networks of mentoring where you're working with individuals as well as resources that kind of compile and meet all of your mentorship needs. Um, and so a lot of the investigation around mentorship has really focused on the classic dyad, but I think where we see the movement in mentorship is really to these much more complex organizational structures around mentorship so that mentees can get all of the things that they need in order to develop and advance. And one way to think about that is there's a lot of things um, and attributes um, that are needed for effective research mentoring relationships. And this is one of the organizational structures we pulled together um, for um, a report we published in 2016. So you might think about in your mentorship, you might play a lot of roles in the research arena, helping mentees develop disciplinary skills, learning the discipline, assessing their understanding of the discipline. You might play roles in interpersonal skills, actively listening to them, building that trust, aligning expectations. And then there's this whole domain of social, psychosocial skills. So providing motivation, helping them build research and career self-efficacy or confidence, building their identity as scientists and a sense of belonging. And then there's a whole domain of diversity cultural skills. How do we help them reduce the impact of bias and stereotype threat in their experience, in our relationships? How are we culturally responsive to our trainees? And then sponsorship skills. So how do you foster independence? How do you help mentees build networks? Now, when I look at this list, I don't know about you, but myself as a mentee, I, a mentor sometimes go, oh my gosh, I can't fulfill all of these roles. And one of the benefits um, of really moving towards articulating needs is when mentees can tell us what they need in a given time, and we can tell mentees what we can provide and what we can't provide. And then they can look at their whole mentoring network, going back to this mentoring network slide, to say eh, all of my needs getting met by the collective and not putting all of those needs and meeting of those needs into one individual. Um, and that is a much more supported structure um, for a mentee than a single mentor uh, for a single mentee. So the other thing um, on these attributes is how do we learn how to do all of these things well? Um, or how do we even learn how to do a subset of them well and optimize our practice? Where does that mentorship education come from? So what we know though um, is the need to be effective mentors because when mentorship is less effective and, and mentors are not, they're absent or they have unrealistic expectations or they don't provide clear and relevant guidance or horribly engage in manipulative and inappropriate behavior, what we get are negative mentoring experiences. And what's really important is that negative mentoring experiences can also come from otherwise good intentions. So we as mentors might have really good intentions, but when they're not implemented effectively, they can have negative experiences. Um, and so I think it's really important to think about, we may have a certain set of skills as mentors that can be optimized. We also might have a set of good intentions that need to be addressed so that we can implement those intention effectively uh, for our trainees and mentees. And you'll hear me interchange that word trainee and mentee to mean the same thing, um, but just some folks like one word better than the other. 
The other thing that the report struggled and with was how identities affect mentorship and to dive into that literature. So we know that identity plays a pivotal role in the formation and development of social relationships and mentorship is a social relationship. And so specific dimensions of identity like science identity and cultural identity are empirically linked to academic and career development and the experience of the mentoring relationship in STEM. So mentorship has this incredible opportunity to ameliorate negative effects of students' feelings of being othered due to their non-science identities in STEM by increasing inclusion and psychosocial support. We know that as mentors, we're trying to help them build science identity. And if we can help them also integrate that with their cultural identity, we can help increase sense of belonging, sense of their own science identity, how they see those identities intersect and a sense of belonging. So that's an incredibly um, important area of growth. And one of the things that the report speaks to is the need for culturally responsive mentoring. So this is a learned set of skills in which all of us, regardless of our race or gender and lived experience, can show interest in and value a student's cultural background and social identity. We don't have to have lived it to be culturally responsive. And this can help our mentees navigate invalidating experiences in the academy and affirm their sense of belonging within a STEM context and reinforce their belief in their own ability to be successful in the STEM context. And there's a lot of work that's being done around how to be more culturally responsive in your mentorship. So one of the things um, in light of that is I wanted um, to just take a moment and ask you, for those of you who are mentoring and acknowledging that four of you said you're not, um, um, so you can decide whether to answer this or not. But for those of you in particular mentoring, what's the biggest challenge in your mentoring relationships currently? And I realize the challenge may be different in different relationships. So you can think about one um, or you can think across all of them. So just pick one. I know that you might want to check all, but if you had to choose one, what's the biggest challenge right now? Give folks another 10 seconds. All right. So I'm going to share these with you. And you can see amongst your colleagues on this webinar is we all have challenges in different areas, um, time being the biggest one. And I think the important thing about that is acknowledging it takes time to be a good mentor. And I think that in some ways that it's often very difficult because we want to be effective and we just can't find the time. And so even having conversations about what time you have or don't have with your mentees can really go a long way to addressing the next challenge, aligning expectations. And then communication, independence, addressing equity, inclusion, motivation, all of these is that in each of our relationships, we will ebb and flow with where these are challenging and where we feel we have skills and confidence to address those challenges and where we really need some tools and resources. All right, I'm gonna close that poll. All right, so one of the things that I wanna acknowledge is that institutions and programs have a huge role in recognizing and addressing barriers of implementation. And this was raised in the report. And so we have to address the fact that institutions need to be able to address the challenges of time, which was pointed out in the poll, resources, making effective mentorship rewarded and incentivizing it, building expertise on our campuses and programs around mentorship, and helping people with confidence to implement new and uh, evidence-based practices. So I want to just honor that you may have the best intentions and be able to put the time in and dedicate to having effective practices, but acknowledging that we'll only get so far if our institutions don't uh, address some of these ba uh, barriers that are listed here. And that was a big point in the uh, report from the National Academies. 
Some of the things that institutions can do and programs can do, and I applaud um, at SCORE for, uh, at New Mexico for taking this on, is what can we do just to support more effective mentorship in your own campus and program? And one of the things you can do is providing mentorship education and providing the, uh, and promoting the use of mentorship tools. And that's what I wanna spend the next 10 minutes or so is letting you know where you can get information and tools to help you advance your own practice. And that's really been the heart and soul of the work that my colleagues and I um, have the opportunity to engage in over the last 15 plus years. So I will tell you right off the bat that the National Academy's report um, on the science of mentorship is a long 300 plus page report. And I know you all wanna go out and read the whole thing. But as many National Academies report is, it's pretty hard to do that. And so what this report and committee did is we also built an online guide. And this is gonna give you the shorthand to the report and access to all of the tools, including the mentorship education tools that I'll discuss with you. They're all linked from this guide. Um, and I have in the slides here, um, circled in orange, how to find that guide. And the online toolkit that was developed by our committee um, is here. And what you can see is that it breaks down the report. It has an overview of the report about why mentorship matters, about the report and the recommendations. It has things um, that show you mentorship functions. It has forms of mentorship, just like the slide I showed you from the report. Things on culturally responsive mentoring, how to uh, ameliorate negative mentoring experiences. And then it has a whole section on mentorship education and program assessment, and then a whole section on mentoring tools. And so for example, under the tools, and this is a little hard to see, but there would be a whole section on actions, research training, and graduate program directors could take. So there's a whole series of actions and tools. Um, and then I'll take you through some of the tools more specifically. One set of the mentorship education tools that are listed here that we've worked on will take you to uh, the Simmer website. And this is uh, the Center for the Improvement of Mentored Experiences and Research called Simmer. The website is just simmerproject.org and it's linked from that National Academy site. And this is the center um, that we have developed and I direct and it's meant to provide resources and organizations and institutions with resources and services to support their improvement of research mentoring relationships. And what this center does is we provide mentor and mentee training and uh, facilitator training for those who want to implement mentorship education. But we also have become a central collection for evidence-based curricula, all freely available, um, which I'll tell you about for mentors and mentees for mentorship education. We have evaluation tools and an evaluation platform and many, many resources um, that you can use to advance mentorship education. Um, including virtual mentorship programs, materials for mentors and mentees, and even songs as case studies to uh, help foster conversations around mentorship. So the core curriculum, as Selena uh, said in my introduction, is the Entering Mentoring curriculum. It's a process-based curriculum that has case studies and problem solving. It's aimed at awareness raising um, across a standard set of competencies. These competencies should look familiar because they were built around the needs of mentors in which they were having challenges, just like we showed in the poll. So how do you better align expectations? How do you maintain effective communication and so forth? There is also a, a validated assessment tool across all of these competencies um, in case uh, the mentorship education is implemented um, and you want to assess it. And we have had um, the resources from many agencies across the country and the time and privilege to study it extensively, including conducting a randomized controlled trial um, of this particular approach to mentorship education. All of the mentor training curricula based on entering mentoring are available on the website and free. And we've adapted it across multiple disciplines and career stages. So, if you want a full curriculum for all of those competencies for the mentors of undergrads in engineering, we have it. If you want the full curriculum in mathematics, we have it. And these were developed by tons of people across the country who live in those disciplines. You can download full curricula. You can also build your own. So every curricula is tagged by career stage of the mentee and discipline and competency. So if you just want a case study to talk about in your research group, 
that addresses how you can all foster independence better, you can just find one activity and download it from this website. We also have worked with partners. This project is led by my friend and colleague Janet Branshaw on mentee training curricula. Across all of these five areas of training development are over almost 100 evidence-based activities for undergrads and graduate students to help them um, in their holistic development as trainees, including how to optimize their mentoring relationships. All of these materials are also available on our website for you to download um, and use. I will say that on our website are also many more resources in addition to what um, the Simmer team and affiliates have developed, including resources for mentees, free online asynchronous trainings for mentors, example mentoring compacts or expectation documents, example and develop visual development plans. So it's a lot to take in, but basically what we've tried to do is serve the nation um, by bringing all of these things together, all of these evidence-based approaches to improving and optimizing mentoring relationships. I also wanna draw your attention to the National Research Mentoring Network at nrmnnet.net. This is a virtual platform for mentors and mentees, there is um, a whole platform with a structured guided mentorship that you could have trainees go to. Um, if they want uh, additional mentors in their network, you could sign up as a mentor to others. Um, there is a whole library of things for mentors and mentees um, that have to do with uh, development of, of training. And then there's a whole social networking platform um, for mentors and mentees to engage in. You can even set up your own group. So if uh, New Mexico EBSCOR wanted to set up a group on this platform for mentors and mentees to engage, it has all the functions of social networking platforms as well as opportunities to video conference and well, and it's all free. Um, Christine? Yeah, go ahead. Um, this is Brittany. I, we have a question from uh, a participant. Is it okay to share screenshots of your slides with colleagues on Twitter? Absolutely. Thank you so much for asking. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yes, you share away. Uh, the more the merrier. I will also just say that the Council of Graduate Schools, um, which you may or may not, it's not a website I used in my practice early on, but have come to appreciate um, if you're doing any work with graduate students, what they have up on mentoring is amazing including this great mentoring in graduate school uh, guidebook. Um, and so these are, again, things that we also have listed on the Simmer website and are uh, referred to in the National Academy Toolkit. So I know that that is a lot in, in 30 minutes, but what I wanted um, to give you um, on Selena and Anne's, on Brittany's invitation was an overview of the fact that there's a lot going on nationally about mentorship because what we want all at the end of the day is to optimize the talent development and training of mentees across career stages and, um, and disciplines. And that you're not alone in wanting to optimize your practice and there are tons of tools out there. Um, many folks around the country, including our team, have tried to pull those together for you. Um, and we wanted to leave um, the rest of the time um, for folks to ask questions either about what's available to you or what's, what you're wondering if is available to you, challenges in your own relationships that um, we could open for conversation in terms of best approaches and troubleshooting. So I'm going to pause there um, and turn it over uh, to the team who's going to um, elicit a Q&A. Yeah, so we have a we have a question already from um, Julia Fogram, um, and she's asking, do you have specific recommendations from the mentoring tools for faculty who are mentoring faculty? Yeah, so that is a great question. Um, I'll mention two things that we do have. I'm going to go back a couple slides. Um, so in the mentor training curriculum, there actually is an entire curriculum for a faculty who are mentoring junior faculty. It is in the clinical and translational science domain, but it is incredibly translatable. So things like um, how to have good communication between junior and senior, uh, uh, junior faculty with their senior mentors, um, how to align expectations, how to foster independence, 
Um, and we have many adaptations of case studies across um, disciplines. So many of those things are in there. The other big thing um, is examples of individual development plans, which I think are incredibly effective at that career stage in particular, because a lot of the mentorship at that career stage is really focused on career development, career exploration, um, uh, career uh, commitment, grant writing. Um, and so there are many um, tools in that regard. The National Academies report, that, um, if, if you are familiar with those reports at all, they have specific charges. The committee was charged with um, examining the literature around the mentorship of grad students and postdocs, not of po or grad students and undergrads, not of postdocs and junior faculty, but many of the things can be applied. But yes, there are specifics. And I would say that um, in terms of, let's say, um, mentorship of junior faculty, let's say in engineering and computer science, um, we do not have many of those things posted, but we are very aware of some incredible work going on in those domains. Others on this call may know as well. And um, you're welcome to email me and I can direct you specifically to some colleagues in those arenas that are doing some really spectacular work. Outstanding. Thank you. Um, your next question, Chris, is uh, from another participant. And it addresses a relatively delicate situation. Um, it seems like different academic systems in different countries have different approaches and cultures of mentorship. Uh, what do you think are the best resources for students and professors that have experienced different approaches to mentorship than those you've defined here, but are operating within the US context? Yeah, so um, can I ask, um, and if the person can respond in the q and I know is, uh, is there a particular career stage of mentee we're talking about? Because my answer will be slightly influenced. So we're talking about the mentoring of undergrads, the mentoring of grad students, or other career stages. So um, all, it sounds like. I'm, I know that's not helpful, but. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. Um, so um, I'm going to give a general answer and then um, a couple follow up with specific things that are really excellent out there. So I think just the nature of the question when when folks I, I want to applaud the fact that there's an acknowledgement that there exists a culture of mentorship. I think it's something we don't often talk about. And even in the US when we do work with other institutions. One of the things that is really important is when people start talking about well, our culture of mentorship is taking a moment and saying, what is that? Because one of the things in programs and institutions is a first step in even being able to say what tools and resources would be useful or we could extrapolate from is having folks struggle with what do we mean when we say our culture of mentorship? So I will give an example. I was recently working with, I'll just say an Ivy League institution on the East Coast which will remain nameless. And they were talking about what could they do across their graduate programs that would appeal to and be relevant across disciplines. So humanities and engineering and computer science and the arts and, you know, interdiscipline here and would acknowledge they had international students, they had national students, all of it. And in the course of the discussion, um, people were saying, well, that won't work for that culture. That won't work for that culture. And what we decided was the first thing they needed to do was go back to the programs they were trying to work with and say, what, draw us a picture of what you think your mentoring structure is and what do you think your culture of mentorship is? That alone can be an incredibly powerful exercise. So for example, when you say the mentors of graduate students in your department or your institution, Who's doing that mentoring? Is it just within the program? Are there mentoring networks? What do you think you mean when you say the culture is supportive or not supportive of mentorship? What do you mean when you say it's competitive, not competitive? What do you mean by the difference of advisor versus mentor? Who's in the role of evaluator versus support system or are those always conflated? So those are just a couple examples of questions that in an umbrella is, that activity alone, I think, is the most critical first step before what a lot of folks do is they jump into, well, let's address the differences in cultures of mentorship when they haven't even defined what their culture is. 
So that's not an easy thing to do. And it's also really insightful to get mentees to weigh in, whether that's by survey, that's by just talking to them informally, by focus group, what they think the culture of mentorship is. There are also some really wonderful assessment tools that are developed, being validated now that can help an institution get at that. Then, once you have somewhere to start, you can start pressing on, how is this the same or different in this department, in this institution, in this country, um, as a starting point? So that's kind of my umbrella, because I think a lot of it is stepping back and starting to define. Otherwise, what you end up is this very circular, non-specific, amorphic, amorphous discussions. That said, there are clearly differences when we are mentoring international students who are here in the US, and there are clearly uh, important cultural differences when we are mentoring people who are abroad. And I will say that for the first point, the best thing that I have seen out there is from the University of Michigan, um, and I believe it's on our Simmer site. If not, I can send it to uh, Selena to pass along on mentoring international students. Um, really, really well done. Really great stuff there. Um, I have less stuff out there. I, our, our work is largely focused on mentorship in the U.S., on mentoring folks who are abroad. But there are some colleagues working on, on some really great programs um, that we could certainly put you in touch with um, that are building some virtual online mentoring programs in which mentors from the US and internationally are mentoring one another. Um, and that's probably the best place to go in terms of because they're living that kind of experience. So I'll pause there and see if I've touched upon at least the different variety of, of that answer because that's a big question. It was a very big question. Um, I think you gave a solid answer and provided resources for people to investigate further. Um, we have another. Um, all right, much of the advice I've received around mentorship sounds more like service and if as if mentoring only builds the career of the mentee and is something a mentor provides as a good member of the scientific community. But most of the time, the mentor is also looking for something from the mentee as well, usually in the form of research work. Faculty usually can't afford to think of a mentee, i.e. grad students, only as recipients of our effort. Do you have ideas about how to think about this relationship as more mutually beneficial and therefore more sustainable? So I'll, I think I'll say two things about that. I, I wanna start from first the mentoring as service and um, the National Academy Report does speak to this and has some uh, work on, on how to make mentoring count. So I wanna start from the valuing perspective. So there's a lot of conversations that are happening now about what does mentoring count towards? It often counts towards service, especially me faculty mentoring faculty. In other domains, it counts as teaching. So they see mentorship of undergrads as part of undergraduate education and, and yet not given teaching credit for it which is where we get into where does it count? What is the mutual benefit? Why would we do it? And then the real interesting part is how infrequently it counts towards research. And yet mentorship is the fundamental, research mentorship is driving the research enterprise, especially at the graduate postdoc level. And how often it's not included in counting towards that when we're talking about kind of the standard three um, legs of the uh, promotion and tenure stool. That is a conversation that I think we're gonna see a lot of interesting push and change in in the next decade. Because if you think about it is if mentorship can start to count in all three domains. So imagine being able to think about mentorship and how it's driving the research enterprise and being able to count it in that domain of your work. And in the teaching domain, where you might be working with undergrads or others in terms of kind of education of them and having some kind of accounting, and I say credit, but I mean that in the broadest sense. But then in the service domain, if you're leading a training grant, you're leading a program like EBSCOR, you're talking about mentorship on a whole different level at the programmatic level. And we have yet, I think, as um, uh, in the science of mentorship to think at the institutional level how to make work count. So that's kind of one end of it because there's making it mutually beneficial, but part of that mutual ben being beneficial is also what it counts towards and how it's valued. So that's one piece. Lots, I think lots of interesting things happening and things to think about where you might wanna push at your own institution. 
On the other hand, I think that it is important even in our own reflection to think about how mentorship is mutually beneficial in our own practice because it helps us also say yes and no to agreeing to be a mentor. Mentoring undergrads is probably not gonna yield in most cases a huge amount of research results. It can, but, that, but it's often the exception. It is really investing in talent development at a very early career stage. Graduate students is really driving the research enterprise. Now grad students mentoring undergrads is also professional development for those grad students. So you can start to think about the system. So the one thing in terms of thinking about mutually beneficial, it gets back to also mentee training, is what are they hoping to get out of it? And is that aligned with what you're able to provide in terms of a learning opportunity? And having those conversations early, because if the answer is no, better to say no to that opportunity than to say yes, because then you get into a place where it's drawing on your time. The system isn't set up for either of you to get out of the relationship what you expect and need. Um, and so having, there are tools actually on one of the resource sites um, that I shared that is about questions you and your mentee should ask before you commit to the relationship. Because I think that has to be done very early because it's the reality is sometimes it is mutually beneficial, sometimes not. But mentees have to think about what they're expecting too, and mentors do too, so that you're on the same page. So that's kind of three levels. I think there's an institutional level of it being valued. I think there is a relational uh, um, importance about are you going to both be on the same page that what you want to get out of it? And there's a reality to that. Um, and then I think there's a lot of individual reflection and, and there's tools for that individual reflection as well. Wonderful. Um, thank you for that detailed response. Uh, I put out a last call for questions. And so we, we will give everyone maybe 30 seconds um, to let us know, probably a little less. And I'll just put this up as folks are thinking of last questions because Obviously, the scope of work that I've shared today is not work I've done myself. This is the work of hundreds of folks across the country uh, from many different groups and many different institutions um, and funding uh, entities. And so I just want to acknowledge um, all of that and the opportunity to, to share some of it with you. Sweet. And it looks like you have answered all of our questions. Um, thank you. Great, and I guess in last minute is Selena, uh, can, and, uh, can I ask you, are, are there certain things that you are hoping for from a programmatic perspective in terms of moving things forward um, while we have uh, some of your wonderful mentors online? Thanks for that, um, that talk. You gave us an incredible amount of food for thought, so it's hard to even formulate where we might start next, and maybe that's our question. Um, there are so many mentoring resources out there. Um, where would you suggest we might take a, uh, a first step as a project with multiple universities and multiple kinds of mentors? Um, yeah, so I guess I would ask, and in, in asking, um, uh, please don't hear it as a judgment of something you should have done. I'm just curious, as, has there been any outreach to the mentees that are part of the program about their satisfaction with the mentorship they've received and any areas of need or interest that would improve their experience. I'm a big fan of starting where your trainees are broadly because usually there's a couple things that come to the surface um, if you have asked or haven't that can really help decide where you want to spend the precious little time you have um, in uh, um, advancing those relationships. So that might be one place is, you know, adding even if you do kind of annual assessment of the folks that are part of the program broadly is including and happy to suggest some based on what's being asked nationally. Just some questions about what's working, what's not working, what, what mentors and mentees would like that would help their own experience in the program. And I would use that to drive much more fully than I would use anything else because it's your folks in their context. And what's the most important is what they need, not what the literature says that they think they should need. Um, because then once those are identified, there's so many resources out there that can help you do a light touch or a deep dive um, once those things are identified. 
that seems really helpful. And we do ask those kind of questions, but I'd be super curious to hear uh, the ways that other people ask those in ways that are maybe more effective to open that dialogue. Um, and we also have an opportunity, we work with a, a cadre of undergraduate students in the summer as an undergraduate research program um, and really can, uh, it's a pretty high touch program and I think we can implement some of the things that you suggested uh, right up front and uh, that starts next week for us. So it's perfect timing. So I really appreciate that. Um, so with that, oh. there are lots of opportunities to to engage in um, uh, bringing um, some of these evidence based approaches, including the mentor and mentee training curricula, uh, to the program either online or face to face, um, including facilitator training events and all of that. And again, all the materials that we curated and developed are free. And then there are also um, services that can be provided if you want to go deeper than what's provided um, for free. So try to make, we want people to just take it and run with it. But we also acknowledge that sometimes folks say, I don't feel ready to do that and um, mm -hmm. want to honor where folks are at. Well, thank you so much. This has been an incredible learning experience for us. And I think it's really going to set us up on a, a, a great direction and um, really improve our mentoring uh, experiences and our, our mentors and, and uh, going forward in the future. I'm also pleased we can share this with others after the fact. So we really appreciate that. And we have great gratitude for you taking time to share these resources with us and your expertise. And we really, I really feel like we've been in, in the presence of somebody who, who really understands and knows mentoring. And we appreciate all of your work on this. Thank you for your time and your expertise. Great. Thanks for the opportunity. And uh, I'll just say a special wave to some familiar names that I saw on the participant list. So uh, <laughs> I've had the pleasure of meeting. Um, nice to see you online. Well, thank you so much. And just as a reminder, we will be um, posting this webinar on our website and uh, that will be available to folks uh, sometime early next week, I think. So appreciate everybody and um, hope everybody has a good rest of your week. Thank you much.